And ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us. And let me introduce to you Mr. Ian Ogilvie. Thank you very much. Thank you. All righty, Ian, I, I, I got to tell you, I was, I, I think probably as with a lot of folks, when the announcement came out that you're going to be here at Monster Island, I was just like, I, I did a double take. I was so excited to hear about you coming here because I, I, I have been following your work for so many years. I don't want to make you sound like I don't mean to do that, but just uh, you've done so much stuff that I have enjoyed over the years since made it over here to the United States. I'm going to ask you just a crazy question out of the box. Try not to blindside you too much. Out of all of your body of work, is there one particular time period or area that just really brings the fondest memories to you about some of the stuff you've done? Oh, yeah. Listen, I, I think it's I think it's when you're young. We, you know, <laughs> we all enjoy uh, ourselves more when we were when we were young. And I think when you have more energy. And uh, I started out quite lucky, really. You know, I mean, I came out of drama school in the very early 1960s, and I, unlike a lot of young actors, I was just very lucky, and I started working almost immediately, and I was able to support wife, two children, you know, we had a car and two, you know, my, uh, uh, I made a living as an actor, which most young actors these days cannot really say they do, unless they're on a TV series or they go straight into, a, into movies, and I just made a decent living all my life as an actor, and, until uh, it stopped, um, because I got too old, <laughs> and, 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 it, it, um, so I had a wonderful time my whole life, but I think probably the answer to the question is probably in the, in the 1960s when there were movies and TVs and plays and I was busy as anything and, and I had the energy to have fun really, I think probably that period, yeah. Also that's when I was doing the Mike Reeves movies, the Witch Finder General and the Sorcerers and the one which will be nameless because it's so awful. Um, <laughs> oh, tell us of an <laughs> Well I would say the 60s was the nicest period for, for because I think any actor will say when they're young and they've got lots of energy. Yeah. I don't think I was very good, by the way. I think I got, <laughs> I think I got much better. Um, but that's experience, you know. You, you, yeah. Was it, was it something, as a kid, that you sort of felt like that's what I wanted to do? I mean, did you yeah. feel the calling very early on? Well, my mum uh, had been an actress. Right. And I don't know if you guys remember the actor John Mills. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, she was his first wife. Oh, yeah. Not like terribly well known, there. Ah. Yeah. Amy Mills and that, Julia. Yeah. yeah. But uh, they didn't have any children. They were married for about nine years. It was, a, it was a very young romance. I mean, she met him when she was 18 or something. Mm. Uh, they were crazy about each other until they weren't. <laughs> he, he, met, he, he met the love of his life, Mary Haley Bell, and uh, uh, they got amicably divorced, uh, and there were no children. But, uh, but she had been an actress herself. In fact, they met together when they were both young actors on a Far Eastern tour. Um, they went everywhere. A huge company. Can you believe this? I don't know how many, there must have been 25, 30 actors in this company. They did something like 15 plays in the repertoire. Wow. She played everything from Ophelia to, uh, 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 um, I can't even remember, I mean, she, they, she was in musicals. And of course, in those days, there were no planes, so everything was by ship and by train. Mm -hmm. She met Noel strange. Coward uh, there. Oh, cool. uh, um, wow. It was extraordinary, and she met Johnny Mills, and they fell madly in love. I have a love letter from him to her, which is the sweetest thing you've ever in your life. But that's why I wanted to be an actor, is because it was in my blood. Also, my father had been briefly an actor after university for about a year, until, as he said, he discovered he hated actors and poverty almost equally. <laughs> <laughs> so he stopped. And he became an advertising man after that. But, um, yeah. It was inevitable, right? Really. <laughs> talk, talk a little bit about your, your experience with the Royal Academy. Because, I mean, that, for those of us that grow up wanting to be actors, I mean, that would be the, the ultimate thing. Yes, it was two, two of the, if you're really asking the best years of your life, any actor will tell you the best two years of your life is when you're at drama school. Because yeah. they, they give you parts without you having to audition for them. Right. You play one for the <laughs> All your relatives come and see you and tell you how wonderful you are. <laughs> and it's a lovely time. Uh, drama schools are a lovely period. I mean, I, I now direct 
about twice a year, maybe three times a year, at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in Los Angeles, which is a great drama school. And I love it. I love doing it. But, but to be honest with you, I look at these kids, and out of 100, 99 of them won't become professional actors. Um, now, I think the training they get is terrific. And I think it helps you in later life. It helps you to make speeches or be in company or present yourself well and all that But the fact is that most of them will not become actors, I right? think. And, uh, and that's the same with my day at Rado. I mean, most, I was in a class of 18. I think, I think I'm the only professional actor who came out of that class. Yeah. So it's one of those odd things, drama school. I don't know if any of you ever went to drama school, but it, it's a lovely time. But it's, uh, and I think it is useful, but it's become so expensive. I mean, my dad was paying, what, maybe 150 bucks a, year, a, ter a semester for me. <laughs> now, the American Academy, it's like going to university. You're talking $30,000 a year. Mm. Yeah. That's a lot of money to, yeah. to yeah. learn to be an actor, isn't it? Yeah. 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 But I loved Rada. Rada was great. It was very nice. It was always a little insecure because you could be thrown out if you if you didn't if you didn't reach the standards they thought you should reach. You could you could be thrown out. I think I was came quite close to being thrown out. As well. <laughs> How about those early years when you you're first getting into the business? Like yeah. I said, you you were able to support yourself as yeah. an actor, which. Yeah, that's very unusual. I mean, even nowadays, it's, it's a difficult thing to do. Well, my rent, I lived on the King's Road in Chelsea, which is a very smart part of London. I had an, I had an apartment, and it cost me £10 a week. What's that, $12 a week? <laughs> I was making maybe 60 Uh Yeah, it was a little bit. I, yeah. I mean, I look at my stepsons in Los Angeles now, and, you know, rents in Los Angeles, I, mean, I don't want to bang on about this, but this is really... $2,000 for a one-bedroom flat. Yeah. But, uh, uh, yes, I was very lucky. I had an excellent agent straight out of drama school. She sent me off. I, uh, I, did, I started straight into television. I did a lot of work in repertory theatres. In those days, every town in England had its own repertory theatre. And in those days, they had each theatre had its own company. So you would join a company, and you would do a different play, a new play, every two weeks. And the old boys would say, well, you're lucky, because we used to do a new play every one week. <laughs> you do a new play for two weeks, you've just about got time to learn the lines, that's about it. And it's terrific training. That doesn't exist anymore, it's all gone. Uh, all those theatres are now just touring theatres. But back then, it was a great training ground for young actors. And um, yeah, I, I got into TV and, and movies quite early on. And of course, like any actor, you have endless periods of being out of work. Of course you do. But it, it was okay back then. I'm not saying the good old days, I promise you, I don't buy all that nonsense. I think the good old days are now, actually, frankly. But, uh, there's more opportunities on television and movies now than there ever were. I mean, all these cable shows, and can you imagine being on Game of Thrones? I, mean, I can't think of anything really more wonderful. Okay. Any ambitious to it? Did you have any opportunities for Game of Thrones? Uh, no, 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 no. I just, <laughs> I suppose if I'd been in England, I could have, I could have had. But that's the thing; everything's cast from where it, it's shot, where it's, it's, where it's based. You know, and, uh, and I have an English agent to this day, and she said, "You know, if you if you were living here, I'd get more work." <laughs> so how 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 long has it been since you moved to America? Thirty years. Ago. Thirty years. Yeah. And I became an American citizen in two thousand, which I'm very proud. Of. Yes. I have two passports, which is lovely. So I get welcome home, Mr. Overly, in both countries, which is <laughs> really Yeah, that was a very safe feeling. I also like voting, frankly. You know, I, I, I'm not very political, but I do like to have that. And I do like the security of it. And I think if you, if you live in a country and you pay taxes, it's manners to become a citizen. And they want you to be a citizen rather than the green card. They don't like the green card very much, and I understand. So if you've got the green card, they say, come on, go to the next target and be a citizen. So I do. Good for you. No, 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 it's not they made a painful period no, experience. No, it was very pleasant. Oh, you were lucky then. Yeah. Really? Mm -hmm. Mother, they got, she got tired of getting dirty looks because her green card was really sold. It was still green, not Oh, uh, yes, yes. <laughs> yes, they don't, they don't like it. You have it forever. They say, why don't you become a citizen? You live here. Yeah. So I've got, I've got something. I've got a couple of notes on here. Some things about you I didn't know. 
that, oh and, and I'm always looking for stuff that, that, that's sort of, sort of the cool stuff that jump out of me, but in 1978-79, the TV Times quoted you the most compulsive character. I, I don't know about that. Did construct that? The most compulsive, do they mean the most compelling? You know, I never understood that <laughs> award. I have that award to this day. And so the most compulsive character, and I went, I, I actually don't know what that means, really. It was just a, it was a TV time, that's like, like our TV guide. You know? Right. Yeah. And in those days, before the internet, obviously, it was very big. It was the biggest selling magazine in the country. Anyway, I was voted by the readers the most compulsive character. <laughs> <laughs> uh, compulsive to watch, maybe. Compulsive to watch is what I, I, I think. think that's what I was supposed to Yes. Yeah. yes. <laughs> I agree with that word choice. <laughs> like, it's very strange. <laughs> <laughs> But I think for those of us over here, I think we probably first became accustomed to you when you uh, took over as the same. This is very odd to me, you know, because very few, I think, I think you guys, are the, those of you who know me from the same, are, are the odd ones out. Because, you know, my show was not publicized, it ran late at night, yep. you so were all one. babies, so <laughs> I don't know how to stay up that long. No. And, <laughs> uh, uh, so I'm always constantly surprised when anybody knows me from that show here. I mean, I'm not known in America particularly well. I mean, I worked here for, for, for quite a while uh, uh, until it all kind of dried up. And that was, I got lucky because I was also writing books at the time and they, they took over. But um, I'm always amazed that anybody saw that series. How, how many folks here remember the same from CBS Late Night? Yeah, CBS Late Night. It really was odd. I mean, it, we were in competition with Starsky and Hutch and all sorts of really <laughs> hip shows. I don't know if anyone wants to see it. In our defense, you're looking at a crowd of people who watched more short lived, soon to die shows okay, than that's right, typical. That's right, right. There you yeah. go. We kind of specialize in those shows. Yeah. But when I worked as an actor in this country, and I don't really anymore, I do if anybody asks me, but they don't anymore. But when I worked as an actor, I would maybe once a year an American actor would say, I remember you from the show. It mostly was not seen, so you guys are, 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 are different. You know? We're hardcore. Hardcore. Yeah, that's yeah. hardcore. What did most people remember you from then? Well, from my, maybe, but probably the movies like, like the Witch Hunter German movies yeah. and that kind of thing, you know, because there was a sort of, they're separate really, but, but, you're, but you guys are not separate. You lump it all in together, which is mm -hmm. lovely. You know? Actually, that, that, that's a good lead in to, I wanted to talk to you about. The Witch, Witchfinder General, mm -hmm. aka the Conqueror Worm. Some of you will know that that's how it was first released right. in, in mm -hmm. this country. But the, the opportunity to work with people like Patrick Weimar, mm -hmm. Vincent Price, and, and the others, it was just an incredible cast yeah. on, on that film. And it really was a kind of movie when it was released here. It was unlike uh, a lot of horror films that had come into the United States. Of course, they gave it the, the Conqueror Worm title, so a lot of people had no idea what that we were kidding about this yeah. when we talked earlier. You know, we thought it was a big bug film or something. <laughs> I thought a lot of us knew it was about, about witchcraft. Yeah. I mean, my dad, funny story, would say, yeah, well, what's the big bug look like? Because we thought it was like a big worm. <laughs> but uh, I'd be curious to hear some of your, some of your reflections on, on, on that production. And, well, I'm sure you, you, most of you probably know why it was called the Conqueror Worm in this country. Um, Vincent Price was forced on us by American International Pictures. By the way, I think we were very lucky to have him because he was a big star. And Mike Reeves, as you may know, wanted Donald Pleasance to play his part. Right. Yeah. And Donald Pleasance is a great actor, but he wasn't a movie star. No, that um, down, yeah. And Vincent was forced on us. And, and this is one of the reasons why Vincent Price and Mike Reeves were not happy with each other because some idiot told Vincent Price. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not clever. Um, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just your reflection on, yeah. the, on the production. And why it was called The Conqueror Worm. Yeah, the why it was called The Well, uh, uh, AIP, American International Pictures, had Vincent under contract, and this was the last movie of his contract, and they had run out of Edgar Allan Poe's subjects. They'd done The Mask of the Late Death, and The Pit of the Pendulum, and The Fall of the House of Usher, and all those movies. And they wanted something vaguely related to oh. Edgar Allan Poe. So they, they went, and they, in desperation, they looked at Edgar Allan Poe's poetry. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And one of the lines is, and death is the conqueror worm. Ah, conqueror worm. Got nothing to do with no, no, no. Which is an actually historically, not act, particularly accurate, but it's an historically uh, piece because Matthew Hopkins, the witch general, did in fact exist. So did his. Yeah. 
his uh, assistant John Stern, they actually started the people. They killed about 300 people, mm -hmm. uh, uh, women mostly, over the course of about three years in the eastern part of England. And so that part of the story is true. So the Conqueror Worm was very odd. But again, I, hey, it got shown here, you know, yeah. and, and was, was popular. You know. it, took, and it, it, it took a few years, but yeah, I think home video helped quite a bit because yeah. people came back and were reintroduced to and realized what an incredible film it was. But well, you, you've got an amazing and, scene in that film yeah. at the end that I oh, that one, yeah. just absolutely slayed most of us that watched it. Then. Well, when I chop him up with an axe. Yes. <laughs> well, by this time, I mean, you guys probably know all these stories, but by this time, Vincent and Michael were on such bad terms that Vincent, this was, his, I think, his last night of shooting, and it was a late night. We had this, this ancient castle for about six hours, and Mike had pages and pages of material to do. We only had it for a limited time. This was the night that Vincent chose to turn up slightly drunk. <laughs> <laughs> and Mike Reeves was so angry about this that before we started, he said, you know with that scene when you hit him with the axe, is that what you really, really hit him? I went, are you mad? <laughs> <laughs> he said, it's rubber, it's a rubber axe. Yeah, I picked up this rubber axe. You know how hard, solid rubber can be? Mm. And it's very heavy. It can hurt this. I'm, I'm not hitting him with it. <laughs> He said, I want you to <laughs> He said, he won't notice, he's drunk, folks. <laughs> the producer, our lovely Philip Waterlove, the, the, the producer there, overheard this, went running off and got as much foam padding as he could find and put it under Vincent's clothes. But even so, I pulled it. I didn't, I hardly hit him, really. But the censor cut nearly all those chops out, anyway, the British censor. And did it all on my friend Nicky Henson's face, who plays my young friend, my young uh, soldier friend. And he played it on his face. And it, you, as we all know, what you don't see in horror movies yeah. is actually yes. more effective. And yes. even Mike, at the end of it, although he hated the fact he'd been censored by the British censor, he said, oddly enough, he said, I think it's even more awful. You, you leaves it to your imagination. You know? Yeah. Oh, it is. It's a, it's a, it's a powerful mm. scene. What a way, and what a way to end the film. And that wasn't the scripted ending, by the way. Yeah. The scripted ending was, I don't know, I find him in a gypsy encampment or something. <laughs> you know? But we ran out of money and time, and so Mike said, this is how we finish the film. We just finish it in the council. Welcome to AIP. Yeah, well, <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, Mike used to get these directives from AIP, from America. And they said, we want more blood. <laughs> and we want more naked women. And we want more blood on the naked women. You know? and, and, and Mike just ignored most of this. Well, that comes, that comes from the Roger Corman School of Production, right. where it, it's supposed to be, uh, if, I, if, if I miss, if get this quoted on here, you can correct me, blood, boobs, and beast. Right. That was his, that was his formula for a successful yeah. horror film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you had to have one of those, uh, or some, some of that, all in all of them. I, I lost track of you a little bit after that film. You were bouncing back and forth here quite a bit, though. You were doing a lot of television work and stuff. Yeah. But all of a sudden comes what I thought the, the miniseries craze was starting here in the United States. And we imported this one from Great Britain called High Claudius. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Brilliant. And you had a terrific role in that. Well, I think. <laughs> I played Claudius's dad. I thought the yeah. actress this was. That's right. So I'm really only in episodes one and two, I think maybe three, I'm not sure. But they're memorable. But Derek, Derek Jackie still calls me dad. <laughs> <laughs> Sir Derek Jackie. <laughs> and uh, the director of that was a lovely man called Herbie Wise. And Herbie mm -hmm. was one of those directors who liked collecting a repertoire of actors around him that he enjoyed working with. I was one. I'd done several things with him before him. So I was able to ring up Herbie and say, can I, I hear you're going to do I told you. He went, yep. I said, can I be in it? He went, yep. I said, can I play Caligula? He went, no. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I said, why not? He said, I've got John Hurt for Caligula. John Hurt was a very big star. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. I said, so what am I playing? He said, you're playing his father, the only sane man who lived in the Roman Empire at the time. Yeah. Um, uh, and I said, oh, it sounds a bit boring. He said, you get to wear one of those breastplates with all the muscles. <laughs> but it was, that, was, that was nice. That was a good show. Yeah. Yeah. 
I showed that to my American wife when I first met her, and she didn't know who I was, oh, another bloody English actor. And I said, I was in that, you know, it's quite, and she went, oh, really? So I showed it to her, and she went, this is a soap opera with togas. <laughs> <laughs> it's like being a restaurant. It is, if you look at it, it's just like a soap but opera. But it's very high tone. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm not a soap opera guy, but yeah, I just... Yeah. Like, it's it's really good actors. It's a story. Oh, wonderful actors. Right? I mean, the amazing people that have. Yeah, well, yeah. 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 Always surprised that they didn't try to follow that up with something. I don't, I don't know what you would follow it up. No, with. I don't know. They actually combined both novels, so yes. it would have been difficult. Yeah, it's quite wise and quite Because, like, Herod isn't in until the second book, and I was That's really right. surprised when I kept reading and reading yeah. when I would come to Herod because I loved that character. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, I guess uh, a lot of American audiences will remember uh, Upstairs, Downstairs. Yeah. Exactly. You know, we, were, we were talking about and we were talking earlier uh, with Mark. Uh, Mark Maddox out here, and uh, Upstairs Downstairs sort of legitimized Masterpiece Theater here mm -hmm. in this country. Sure it was, I remember you were, you were talking about all these TV shows coming over here to the United States, but yeah. they really raised the bar here in the United States because Masterpiece Theater. Yes, well we weren't making Masterpiece Theater, right. we were making, just <laughs> making a TV show, and at the time, it, you know, it started out as a black and white show, but mm -hmm. before we had color. The episodes I did. I, I was at the very end of the first series and the beginning of the second series. I think, I, again, I only had like four, maybe five episodes. I once said to an American producer, I was in upstairs, downstairs, and he went, Oh, really? What did you play? I said, I described the character, but I married the daughter of the house, but it turned out to be like, impotent, all gay, <laughs> all bone. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I was gotten rid of. He went, So how many episodes did you do? I said, I think four, three, four, five. And he went, he said, if you'd play that character in America, you'd done two years of yeah. just playing that character. <laughs> yeah, that was a lovely show as well. But again, at the time, we didn't know that it was an iconic show at all. We just thought it was just another TV series, you know? And then it became this extraordinary thing, which give, gave rise to things like that and Abbey, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was Abbey is the upstairs downstairs. Yeah. It is of this generation. Yeah. 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 And again, you see, they improved on it by actually going to a country house that actually exists, and so you get this grandiosity. I mean, we, we, we were, we were on sets and things. They only use that house for the exterior. It's actually all filmed on the set. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. Sure. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Touch, touch the house. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to ask the audience one question here before I talk to you about it. You know, I think you know what I'm going to ask you. How many of you are familiar with a, a film called The Day the Fish Came Out? Oh, I'm so happy. Oh, yeah, we're going to send some is it folks that find the movie. No, no. This is it. There was a lovely a Greek film director called Michael Kakianis who made Zorba the Greek. Right. This was a huge hit, right? Absolutely. And so Columbia Pictures said to him, do whatever you like. I'll give you all the money in the world. <laughs> so he wrote, directed, designed all the costumes for this aberration of a movie called The <laughs> And it starred... A very young Candice Bergen, yep. oh. uh, Sam Wanamaker, yep. Tom Courtney, yeah. Colin Blackley, um, a terrific cast. A terrific cast. Yeah. And Candice Bergen and I were love interests in it. Mm -hmm. And the Hollywood Reporter, who gave the movie a horrible review, <laughs> well deserved, said about Cand he said Candice Bergen and Ian Ogilvy are the stupidest and skinniest <laughs> lovers we've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> Which I love. That. It's a horrible. Movie. It's, it, 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 it was made in, I don't know, 1967, something yeah, like that. Yeah, it was late 60s. Yeah. And it, it showed the future. I think the future was 1994. Oh, wow. It was. Yep, and right. Michael has designed all the costumes, which were just ridiculous. It was the ridiculous movie. It was so silly. <laughs> <laughs> and, when, and many years later, when I came to America, I got a job as a, the leading guest part in... Uh, Murphy Brown. <laughs> <laughs> so I hadn't seen Candice, of course, since that day. So I go on, I said, she, I thought she wasn't around. I go on the set, and I'm just standing there, and I just see her across the other side, and she sees me, and she puts her head down, and she walks straight over to me, and she says, how long has it been? And I said, it's been about 30 years. <laughs> so she said, was that the worst film ever made? I went, yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. And I said, have you got material from it? She went, God, no. I said, I do. I've got a scrapbook full of pictures of us in our ridiculous <laughs> costume. She went, I said, I'll bring it in tomorrow. And she went, white. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, no, please. She 
said, don't do that. Whatever you do, if it gets into the hands of, my, of the crew, my life will not be worth it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, please, I beg of you. I did, I did anyway. So. <laughs> no, it was a, I plead, I, it really is just not worth seeing. It, it, it's one, one of the reasons why it's never been seen since. It was just a dreadful, dreadful film. Yeah, she was on a real bad run. And she, she'd done a couple of indie films here. I, I, I just discovered her. Wait, did you ask her about it? No, I, I mean, I, I, I became a fan of hers right. from a little film she called uh, T.R. Baskin. Yes. And you know, she did pretty well with that. And then she gets a string of horrific films. And the, people like fair. the Hollywood reporters of a really but she was like living. she was like 19 or something. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, accusing her of her being wooden actors. Yeah, they kept comparing her to the dummies. And, and of course, then, yeah. so when this film came Easy. out, yeah. she didn't stand a chance. No, but not And, uh, yeah. No. Yeah, a few of us actually saw it in the theater for yeah. the week that it lasted. I mean, Michael Cacchio is a sweet man, but but he's Greek. <laughs> <laughs> he was giving Tom Courtney line readings, how to save the mind. We thought it was great. You never know. You very rarely know, to be honest with you. you, you and also, you always got that wonderful rush of enthusiasm and happiness that you're working. Hey, I'm working. It's got to be good. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily. It, it, it reminded me so much of um, the same thing happened here with an American director who had a big hit and they gave him all the money in the world and said he could do whatever he wanted. He did a film called Heaven's Gate, which oh, banged yeah. on MGM. Yeah, yeah but similar you look at it, you look at it, Heaven's Gate now, and, and there's wonderful it's things. It's not that bad. No, it's like Ishtar. You know, this yeah. thing that, that destroyed me. It's actually kind of fun. I, I, <laughs> some, of the, some of this thing is like a snowball. Word of mouth is bad and it gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse and it's not fair. Because sometimes things are not, don't deserve that reputation. The day the fish that came out deserves it. <laughs> <laughs> so find a copy to watch it, just to see if we're right. Because sometimes watching the bad stuff, that's one that's going to bore you. Yeah. Yeah. What, what do you think is the best, best project you've ever worked on? Oh, well, I don't know. I mean, maybe it's hard to yeah. tag. I mean, they, they, again, it's how long is a piece of string? It's, mm -hmm. it's one of those things where you go, in what genre, really, you know? I mean, the most, in terms of, of, of long-lasting reputations, I have to say the oddly, the, the low-budget Witch Fund General or Conqueror Worm mm -hmm. is the one that generates the most interest among people who are really movie buffs like you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, and it was a fun, joyous movie to work on. Um, but it's not the, big, the biggest film I ever made was Waterloo, and nobody said, sees that now. How many of you have ever seen the movie Waterloo? Well, you know, that was an enormous movie. Yeah, but that would probably be a little too English for most Americans. Who did you play? I played a character called William DeLance, who was like the quartermaster general to Wellington, the Duke of Wellington. Oh. Um, and about the Battle of Waterloo. And we shot right. it in Russia. I figured that much out. Yeah. yeah but, it, 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 but now, today, you see, it, it would be made with yeah. CGI. Yeah. But we had 25,000 extras. Yeah. They were the Russian army. We had the Russian army dressed in a Napoleonic uniform. Oh. And when you saw them in the, on the battlefield, those, that's not CGI. No, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's a good film, but they never get shown. But, oh, well, it's, it's, it's kind of tedious in a way. You know? What stands like out in your book? Because you had a great cast in that. You had Orson Welles, Orson Welles and Christopher Plummer, and Rod Steiger, and Jack Hawkins, and Michael Wilding. Oh, um, yeah, that's a pretty high ranking cast. Well, that was a big no. But it was a, in Russia, it ran like eight hours, I think. They cut it down to about three. It was one of the last epics yeah. before CGI really started. Yeah, yeah it, it was It was a little over, I think, right, yeah. right at about three and a half hours. I saw it in the theater. So. You saw it in the theater? Yes, I did. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah there's and a I don't know what you felt about it. What year did that come out? 69, oh, 70, something like that. Yeah, it was just before I started high school. 1970. 1970. 1970, yeah. yeah. And it was a massive movie. And, uh, it was huge. We all went rushing off to Russia, and we were there for, and this was in communist Russia, of course, so mm -hmm. we were there for months on end. Was it an interesting stay, or very awkward? Yeah, it was, it, the, it was the, the food was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the snow you was couldn't horrible. go anywhere. If you started going for a walk, and you got to the outskirts, we were in a little town called Ushgorod, mm -hmm. 
which means Snake City, I think. <laughs> and uh, the people were there were very nice, but they're very standoffish uh, and didn't really want to talk to us. And then we were told, well, they started getting friendlier, and we were told that the, the authorities had told them that all Westerners were syphilitic. I'm not to go near it because he's going to be serious. So, but they learned that, that we weren't. So, um, it was a very strange. I, I took my. I was then married, uh, and I had a, two little children. I had a little six-year-old, and I had a, a, a six-week-old baby. I took all of them to the Russians. Bad idea. Um, but, it, but to go out to that battlefield and to see just the sheer numbers, it took about an, over an hour for the extras to arrive. Just, and they marched, by the way, in full union of Holy Long and Yonfolk from yeah. Barracks, which was eight, something like seven miles away. They marched. So cool. Oh, okay. wow. yeah. It's the only way you could shoot that movie yeah. with, with soldiers, you know. Yeah. And they had these enormous trucks with, uh, which were just loudspeakers, amplifiers. And their sergeant would stand there with a microphone and he would bellow at the microphone in orders in Russian. You'd see regiments walking into their spots, and you could set up a shot like that in half an hour. Can you imagine doing that with extras? They, you know, they want their lunch. The closest thing to that, I guess, was getting to the Turner Productions. Right. So nothing on that scale. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they, the Russians built the, the battlefield to like a third scale, because that's how num the numbers were. They'd spent like two years building it before, and they laid irrigation pipes underneath so they could recreate the mud, and it was just wow. a massive undertaking. It's a weird movie to think of, because Tsar Alexander thought he was the one who defeated Napoleon. It's a weird movie for communist Russia to be... Well, they, they were rooting for Napoleon, aren't they? Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. They, the, yeah, they really were. <laughs> I guess because he came from, from nothing, really. <laughs> and, and Wells, the uh, Duke of Wellington was, was aristocracy, then. <laughs> well, I lightened it up a little bit because you, you, I loved, loved this, the Murphy Brown story. It was great. You became a favorite on Murder She Wrote. Five different appearances, five different characters. Yeah, yeah. You know. Well, Angela, Angela Lansman was one of those great ladies. There were two shows in Hollywood that ran pretty much concurrently where you didn't have to do an audition. One was Murder She Wrote, and one was Diagnosis Murder. Mm -hmm. And everything was done on reputation. And if Angela and Dick liked you, you got put on a list, and they would make sure you'd get a murder she wrote and a diagnosis murder every year. <laughs> and you were not expected to turn it down, by the way, because oh. you didn't have to do an audition of them. So if my agent rang up and said, murder she wrote, I get, whether it was two lines or whether it was the guest star, it didn't really matter. And she just, and the, the great thing about Angela was that she loved dragging retired old movie stars yeah. out of retirement said, come on, come and do one. And she got the most extraordinary cast together. And when that show was cancelled, Angela was getting more fan mail than, at Universal Studios than anybody else. And Murder, She Wrote was the highest rating show, and that's when they cancelled it. Do you know why they cancelled it? Too old demographics. It's the demographics. Mm -hmm. yeah. They want young audiences. The, the, the theory behind it, apparently, I was told this, is that, is that we're all of a certain age, guys, here, and we are going to press toothpaste till the day we die. <laughs> <laughs> and we're, we're difficult to change our mind. But the young are, are more susceptible to advertising. So the advertisers said, we don't care how many people watch this, it's the wrong people watching. So that's when they cut all those shows and replace them with the Kardashians, essentially. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And all those shows employed older men and women like me. So I, this is one of the reasons why I and a lot of my contemporaries pretty much stopped working on American television almost overnight. I'm one of the lucky ones. At that time, I started writing books. And, and I actually did better out of my books than I did out of my own. So I was OK, but a lot of my contemporaries uh, you know, had a very difficult time of it for a while. Because they just chopped all those great shows, you know. Yeah, they wanted everything geared to 18 to 45. That's what they wanted. And they, they truly cut it off. Yeah, Matlock, all those things. That was yeah. the voice. Which is stupid because I spend so much more money now. Well, you know, know, yes, but, but you look at the same I bet you buy the that same stuff. Yes, I buy new stuff a lot of times. But one of the popular shows in syndication is yeah. Matlock, Diagnosis, Murder. Oh, yeah. Because yeah. 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 the one thing for Grasco was even though the older people watched it, 
the younger people got stuck watching with their grandparents. So like, yep. we have more vivid memories of those because we associated with watching it with grandma and yeah. grandpa and stuff yeah. like, and like your yeah. parents. Yeah. yeah. Which is dumb. If they had just admitted that she was the one killing everyone in Russia. <laughs> <laughs> she was killing it, I'm telling you. <laughs> it makes sense. I even did one, I even did one, which was designed actually as a pilot mm -hmm. for a new TV show starring me and um, lovely actress, whose name will come to me in a minute. But, but Angela was at the very beginning of it and at the very end of it, and the rest of it was our show. But again, we, the, 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 the lady I was working with and I, even then, our ages, you know, I was then in my late 40s, pushing 50, I suppose, and um, even then we were too old. Yeah. But now, with a lot of the cable channels, there's a lot of things targeted to 40, 50, 60 yeah. people. Okay. Okay. Lifetime has a, has a, and, a, 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 what's the other one? But they have, Hallmark has a, right. a cozy mystery of the week. Yes. There's different uh, yeah. people all in their 40s and 50s. I think, but those, but those are, are mainly cable shows or something like that, where yeah. they're not dependent on advertisers so much. You know, they're dependent on, Subscription fees, you know, yeah, and uh, this is why I think it is better now. I just listen. I was I was very lucky all my career. I was in the golden age of television, mm -hmm. whether it be here or whether it be in England. It was the absolute golden age of television. We all worked. We worked consistently, and we were very very lucky. It's not so easy now, but uh, and yet there's more work around. You know? mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about the writing, because uh, you know. The, the books, yeah. you, you, you wrote a series of several successful books. And yeah, uh, well I wrote a couple of books that were published in England and my mother bought most of the copies of <laughs> <laughs> But they weren't published, I'm not self-published. That's a fun thing. Yeah. They make good Christmas presents, what do you <laughs> And then I, then I had this idea for a children's book, which I never written a children's book, but I, I sat down and I wrote it, and I had this literary agent, and she absolutely loved it, and she put it out to auction, which is quite rare apparently. Mm -hmm. uh, and she got a whole bunch of English publishers chasing after it. So all of a sudden I made quite a lot of money out of this first book. Same thing happened here. American uh, publishers also began chasing it. And I made a lot of money here. So all of a sudden I think, you know, I'm screw acting. I'm, I'm an author now. <laughs> then they said, okay, this is a series. So I know, okay. So I wrote four more. And um, um, they didn't do particularly well in America. They did very well in Germany. They were sold all over the world. Um, they did quite well in England. They did very well in Poland and uh, Italy. And, um, and they lasted a long time. Robert Zemeckis bought the series to make a film out of it. Uh, that sat on his back burner for five years. But meanwhile, they pay you what's called option money. Mm -hmm. Option money is quite nice. <laughs> <laughs> then that option expired and he dropped it. And then it was picked up by an Indian animation company called Prana, which were quite grand, uh, and they paid me even more than Robert Zemeckis had. And that option lasted five years, then it finished, and I thought, okay, that's the end of that. And, and all of a sudden, so I hear, don't hold your breath, but I hear we're in negotiation now with AMC. Oh. Well, AMC is a different kettle of fish, guys, because now we're talking about a series, yeah. and then we're talking about slightly more likelihood of it actually being done, I think. Uh, so, well, that have keep some it um, no it has something better. It has a thing called a wrath monk. Oh, wrath monk. <laughs> I invented. I invented the word. A wrath monk is a mad wizard, demented wizard, um, who is very dangerous, obviously. And I remember it's very sweet. This. I remember I was on the tube, and my books had just come out in England, and they were doing quite well. And I see next to this woman. And she had a copy of it. She had it with her friend, and she was talking about it. And she said, "You know, when I was a little girl, I was." Terrified of Rathmines. <laughs> I, just, I just invented that word about a year ago. I want to take, take time now to open up for some questions from the audience before I run We've a all time. met. We've all pretty much met already, haven't we? So we might have had our conversation. Yeah. I've got one from the yes. I love I, Claudius and I love Livia. And I don't remember your episodes well enough, no, because I thought Sean Phillips' Olivia was a cool, scary, but cool character. Did you have any cool scenes with her? Because she was your mom, right? She was no, Bruce's mom. No, she was my... Stepmom. Everybody oh. was my stepmom. No, she had to be your mom. 
Because our curse isn't Tiberius' brother? Yes, that's right. <laughs> she was your mother. She was my mother. Yes. Yeah. You should tell me something I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, no, most of my scenes were either with Tiberius, which is George oh. Baker, or with Augustus, who was dear old Brian, bless him, oh. the noisiest actor that's ever lived. <laughs> <laughs> he was actually quiet, though. Yeah. Was, was he real boisterous? Oh, he's, he's been oh, boisterous. Because he's loud now, but he wasn't like, oh, he's oh, a noisy man. Yeah, very sweet man. <laughs> but he's still climbing Everest. And he's 104 years old, and I don't know what happened. Go, go, yeah. Go. yeah. 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 That was a fun thing. But as I say, I was only in it for three episodes, and uh, there is a story about that. The, the, my character is a great general, and I'm up in Gaul somewhere, and I'm mortally wounded in the leg, which apparently turned poisonous, and he died. And um, so the idea is that I'm carried on a stretcher in a scene into a tent. And during the, we used to rehearse these things like a play. You know, we didn't shoot it like a movie. We'd rehearse it for a week, and then it would be videotaped, the whole scene would be videotaped. So the scene where I'm carried on a litter, on a stretcher between the two soldiers, we rehearsed, but there was no stretcher. So all I could do was walk between the two men. <laughs> <laughs> and at one point, Herbie Wise, the director, said to me, Ian, are you ever going to act the fact that your leg is broken in four <laughs> places and you, it's going to be... I said, Herbie, I would love to act that, but I can't really do it and walk at the same time. I, I, I mean, what, you want me to limp heavily? That wouldn't really make sense. Uh, so he said, are you telling me you can only act horizontally? I said, yeah, pretty much. You, know, you should put that on your resume. Uh, I think yeah, that's uh, the Eventually the stretcher turned up, and I said, this, now, now I can do it. I go, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Directors are strange creatures. They are some, they ask the weirdest things of you. Wow. Directors are like best ones who don't speak to you at all. Really? So, so what was your experience like working with Boris Karloff? Magic. Oh, good, yeah, I'm glad I forgot about the source. It, it was absolutely yeah. magic. Yeah. I mean, I didn't work with him for very long because, again, a bit like Witch Hunter General, where Vincent Price's and my stories run parallel. <clears throat> we only meet briefly. Same thing with Boris. I spent, I suppose, two days shooting those scenes with him. And uh, he was, I know that his reputation is famous uh, for being a sweetheart, and he really was. He was a very kind, nice, dear man, very funny. I said to him once, we got quite friendly, I said, do you ever feel typecast? And he went, happiest day of my life was when I was tight. <laughs> <laughs> he said, before that, Hollywood didn't know what to do with me. He said, I played everything from Native American Indians to Italian gangsters. And, yeah, and he said, here I am, because you know, he was an Anglo Indian. Yeah, he's written, yes, he was half Indian. And his brothers were very uh, grand people in the English diplomatic service. Uh, his real name was William Henry Pratt. And it was quite a grand family. And uh, he was the black sheep because he'd gone to Hollywood to be an actor. <laughs> but I said to him about the typecast, and he said, no, he said, they didn't know what to do with me. And then James Whale got me the monster. And he said, after that, after that I had a career. And I was a star. And he said, before that. So he said, I don't really believe in typecasting. He said, your typecast, I'm not going to do his voice. He, he lived to be one of the few actors who actually couldn't say his essence. <laughs> <laughs> like, like Sean Connery, a shoshy voice. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but he said, uh, he said, we're all typecast today, we're born. He said, you know? he said you're, you're a young, like, okay, nice looking leading man. You know? He said, I was always a, a character actor from the day I was born. Said, so you, if you are typecast, embrace it. Because it'll mean you've got a career. You know? A lot of refreshing attitude, I think, absolutely. Yeah. But he was sweet. You know, he, by the time I worked with him, he was uninsurable. You, know, you have to be insured to be in with him, just in case you hurt yourself and the filming stopped. And you couldn't insure Boris. He wasn't well, and he was very well. So he had, a, he had a set fee, which was affordable. His fee was £11,000. It was about, what, $15,000. Whether it was one line or whether it was the leading role, he said, that's what I charge to do the film. Everybody could afford that. And that's why he worked all the time for the day he died. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. Yeah, he nice, did. nice man, very sweet man. Mm. Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Oh, uh, so random, random question. Uh, 
question. What was it like doing Death Becomes Her? I know you're only in like two scenes, yeah. but that movie was re-edited heavily. Yes. So, because even like the tr even from the release of the trailer to the actual movie, they're completely different. Yeah. So, and I know like several bigger actors were even cut from the mm -hmm. movie. Mm -hmm. So, what was that like? Well, Death Becomes Her. Yeah. It was Mr. Chagall. Yeah. Do you know the least of that? <laughs> One of my favorite. I would happily play that role for the rest of my life. <laughs> One of the best parts I've ever had, actually. Because, I mean, being a queenie, swishy, middle European, trashy guy, it's great fun to do. <laughs> um, uh, no, I, they didn't cut anything of me. Uh, the reason I have fifth Billy in that movie is because Tracy Allman was in it, playing uh, Bruce Willis's girlfriend. And it wasn't that she was awful, they just decided they didn't need the character, so they cut her out entirely. So I, I don't remember. I love that. It's, really listen, I, I, that, that audition was extraordinary. I went to it, it was just me and the casting director. And there was pictures of Terrence Stamp and Michael Caine and people like that on the wall. And I went, why am I here? You know, <laughs> she went, no, come on again. So I did it. She said, I think that's very funny. I'm going to show that to Robert. So she did. And then Robert Zemeckis called me and he said, can you do that again? And I did it for him. And shrieked with laughter. She said, oh, great, got the part. Simple as that. And um, I loved it. And working with her, with Meryl Streep, was, was, again, I had one day with her. One day. I think I, I was arrived at eight. I think we were done by the time. That's it. He shot it in a very odd way. He had a circular set built. And the crew couldn't be in it. We were, all the crew were outside. And the camera was on a crane, on a spinning crane like that. So if you see the scene, the idea, nobody, nobody gets this. It's quite clever. But she comes into the room and the door shuts and she's having this conversation with the young, pretty beautician. And the camera is revolving all the way around the room. I think he does this twice and suddenly I'm there. Nobody's ever noticed this. And he went to all this trouble to do this and I don't think anyone's noticed it. How, where did I appear from? I actually wondered that. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh, you did now. He said, oh, good. I'm glad you did. Because he like, really wanted people to notice that. She walks past the chair and there's yeah, nobody exactly. there. I think she I think she did. She throws the purse. The next time I come around the chair, I'm sitting in the chair. It's quite simple. I'm just standing behind the camera. Like that. And then when the camera's then I told him. But I said to her, it was a big thrill for me. I was terribly starstruck. And I said to her, um, would you mind terribly if I at one point touched your face? And she said, Ian, this is your scene. She said, look at it. She said, all I'm doing is reacting. It's a reactive scene. Everything is on you. It's all your scene. You you take it. You do whatever you damn well like with it. I'm just reacting. Of course, <laughs> when you look at the thing, her reactions are sort of magical, really. And every every take on her, she did was completely different. I thought, how do they choose which one they're going to use? Because they're all brilliant. She was a very nice lady. And then later on, I have this scene with the big crowd scene where I have to make a little speech. And she, uh, she said, Ian, yeah, come, come and meet Goldie, come and meet Goldie and Bruce. And so she was charming. She was the nicest woman in the world, yeah. Very giving. Mm. But anyway, that was the, it was a lovely audition and a lovely experience. You're right, two days <laughs> on that movie. But you didn't get cut. And I didn't get cut. No, no, no. That's always a plus. Yes, Matt. So. What was your feelings about Robert Zemeckis? Did you interact with him much? No, he left you alone. I, I had to I, I improv. I improvised a, one of my early lines, uh, and I thought, I wonder if he didn't let me get away with it. But I thought, well, there's no harm in trying. So I, and he didn't mention me. He just left me alone. Didn't say a word. All he wanted me to do. We all of us who had who have taken this potion didn't quite work with me because I had this little eye tick. He wanted me to do this sort of eye twitch, a tick in the right line. And at one point he said, Could you do more? And I said, I can, but doesn't that debase the currency of it? If I do too much, I mean, you're absolutely right. No, don't do it more. <laughs> those, those are the kinds of directions of mine. He left me alone. He left me entirely alone. I think he, want, I think he saw what I did in the audition, and he said, no, you just do that. You know, it's funny. You know? Yeah. But I liked him. I mean, I love being left alone. I, I don't really want to be told. To do. I've been in the business over half a century. And, and I may not be all that good, but I kind of know what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> Did yeah. you get to work with Monica Bellucci at all? Because you were introducing her in that movie. Uh, um, 
Not Monica Bellucci. Uh, um, was she in that? Yeah, she's Lisa. She's Lisa. No, no, no. That's um, that's uh, this is Isabella Rossellini. Isabella Rossellini. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And yeah. Some stuff to do with her. Yes. No, I, she, I didn't have anything to do with her, did I? But she was very sweet. She kept coming up to me and saying, "Oh, Ian, you're so funny." <laughs> she was like, I don't think I get. I didn't. I, I don't get to meet her in the movie, do I? No, no. no. You introduce her. All the time. I introduce her. Yeah. Right, yeah. Oh, Ian, you're so funny. <laughs> Yeah. You were on, um, you guest starred on an episode of Babylon 5, which is one of my favorites. Oh, yeah. And I was wondering if, who did you, I assume you worked with um, Peter. Okay, what's his name? Uh, Jurassic. Londo. Jurassic. So did you have anything interesting? Was that an interesting? Jurassic. That was a bit of a, a difference for you. Did you yeah. enjoy that? Or? Yes. But here's a weird thing. So, I guess there's one long scene at the end of which I die. So I called Fred o'clock in the morning and I'm dead by midday. Wow. So I'm there for, what, four hours? And uh, about a year later, my agent said, uh, uh, Warner Brothers is sending you, I think it was Warner Brothers, sending you a box of trading cards oh, of your yeah. character. <laughs> and they want you to sign each one, and they pay a dollar a card. It's a thousand dollars just to sign a thousand cards. You take it a week out. This is very nice. <laughs> but I said, you know, I was only in this thing for, for an hour or something. Doesn't matter. I mean, that that character has gone on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, the, the leading man in Babylon Five, Bruce Boxer, yes. is my wife's ex-husband. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we get on fine, by the way. But I don't actually meet him in the show. <laughs> I, I think I have. You, I mean, that sounds rude, but I think I have your card. You I have the card. Play, you I have the ridiculous card game, and I better have your character yeah. on there. Yeah. 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 That's funny. Yeah. yeah. Hollywood is weird for that. Yeah. 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 Got time for one more? Everybody's good. They all know everything there is to know about me now. <laughs> <laughs> it's very embarrassing you're talking about yourself because people go, do people really want to know all this stuff, you know? And yes, that means there's somebody else who knows. Did you have a favorite director that you actually, that you learned a bit from? I mean, that, that carried you through your career? I think I'd say the answer to that is yes in the theater. Yeah, and it's something that I spent half my life in the theatre. Um, after my TV show, The Saint, I was almost unemployable on, on English television. So I went back to the theatre and I did 10 years in the West End of London, you know, playing the most fabulous roles. And when people say to actors, what do you prefer? Do you like theatre, TV, or films best? The usual answer is, is well, it depends what you're talking about. Theatre for the, for the material and for the audience feedback. The fact is you actually, it's, that's where you're king. Yeah. That's where the act is really done. Movies is great for excitement and money and locations and glamour. <laughs> and television used to be the, the kind of bread and butter, everyday money. But I think you learn as an actor more doing theatre than anything else. And uh, there's a lovely English director called Elijah Mashinsky, uh, who I think I learned a lot from. In terms of moves, it very much depends whether the director trusts you. If he trusts you, he, he leaves you alone. Mike Reeves would say, could you do that quicker? That was it. He didn't have any other, other direction at all. He did with, to Vincent Price, but it was all in the negative. Could you not <laughs> wave your hands around? Could you not roll your eyes? Could you not do that funny voice you do? Could you not? So that's one of the reasons they didn't go on very well. But, but Mike didn't direct, and most of the really good one, Don, the great Don Siegel, mm -hmm. his rule of thumb was if I cast it right, I'd only have to speak to the actors at all. It's true. Yeah, no. And um, I think most good film directors, if they cast it right, they leave you alone. Yeah. But theatre directors are slightly different because it, you, there's more detail involved. In the so in doing British uh, stage theatre, I mean, the stage, TV, and movies, it's like the same group, whereas in America it looks like a completely different set of actors. It's because we're separated by right. the art. But, yeah. but does, does that, do you feel that way in America? That, yeah. That, 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 maybe if these TV actors had more stage training, maybe a little more, might it be better? Sometimes. Well, my lovely <coughs> wife, she started out as an actor. She was in How the West Was One. It was where she met Bruce Fox. Oh, yeah. She played Laura, the, 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 the one of the daughters. And um, 
Kitty literally was one of those people who, she had a boyfriend at the time who was going on an audition. She thought, oh, I'll come with you. And she got there and the casting unit went, you, come and read. <laughs> she got it. <laughs> then she got two more. <laughs> then she got the How the West is one. She had not a day of training. She'd never done a play in her life. She's the kind of actor you want to kill. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to say, I'm sorry to come back on it because, because she has tried to do theatre. She's done some theatre. And she's tried, she, and she's, I think she's very good, but she's decided she absolutely hates it. She's, I am too scared. She, I came to it too late. I'm, I, I'm throwing up at one end and doing awful things at the other. End. She says, I can't do it. Yeah. So the answer is yes, sometimes you do. I always say to young actors, because I work at the American Academy, I say, You're so wise to come here and not just go to class. Because going to class, I think a lot of the time is not terribly useful. But come to a go to a proper drama school and get some experience under your belt at least. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to do theatre anymore because it's too much like hard work. Really. And it's also, it's also became too scary. I mean, I've done Henry Higgins in My Fair Lady three times, and that here in America, and, and that is the hardest and the scariest thing I've ever done in my life. Yeah. Well, because Henry Higgins, I don't know how well you know My Fair Lady, but uh, very well. Oh, yeah. If you look at Henry Higgins' songs, yes. they are lists of adjectives. Yes, mm -hmm. this is true. Yeah. That's what they exactly. exactly. for the adjective in memory. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> they are a nightmare for that. At my age, I, I, I don't know. Well, I'm too old now, but, but, uh, um, but that was the hardest thing I ever did. Yeah. You have to enunciate every single letter. Yes. 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 Who was your Eliza? We had, I had three. Uh, the first one uh, uh, was unknown. She was fabulous. She was from New York, and I can't remember her name. Uh, she was one. She had the most beautiful voice. She, uh, she was African American. The only African American uh, Eliza I've ever seen. And nobody, she was, nobody even noticed. Nobody took any notice of it at all. It was magical, really. It was, and there also there's actually no reason at all why she couldn't be. You know? um, but she had the most lovely voice. The second one was Jodie Little Mermaid. The voice of Little Mermaid. Jodie Benson. Yeah, yeah Jodie was the second one. And that was a touring production. We took that to Kansas City and Phoenix, and here at and Los Angeles and somewhere else. And um, the last one was a small semi-college production done down at Huntington Beach in Los Angeles. And she was not, she was unknown. Yeah. Jodie was great. Jodie was, and her husband played Freddie Hansford Hill. We <laughs> <laughs> could sing too. I read something about that you were in consideration to replace Roger Moore mm. as James Bond, and then something. What, what was the deal there? Is that true? Well, the DS. Well, <laughs> every time, every time the English press had a had a slow day. <laughs> I used to do. This is when Roger was sort of leaving. It was who's going to be the next James Bond? Well, obviously I was in contention because I'd just done the same, you know, having right. taken them from him. But also there was all sorts of other English actors on the list, Martin Shaw, Lewis Collins, a whole bunch of them. And they would always do this thing. And uh, journalists were always saying, are you going to be the new James Bond, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then one day I was at lunch somewhere out in the country and there was this American guy there and he, said, and he was from the production company. And I think he, he handled some, I think he handled publicity or something. He said, I want a word with you. Come out. And he said, I, I think this is only fair to tell you this. He said, you have been considered quite seriously because of Roger. He said, but we decided we didn't want another Roger Moore. We wanted another Sean Connery. Mm -hmm. So they got Tim Dalton. Yes. So I was one of the few actors who actually knew I wasn't going to be James Bond. I, 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 I know this doesn't sound realistic, but I have to tell you, the relief was huge. Because mm -hmm. I didn't think I was right for I didn't think I had the weight. If I stood, if you stood me next to Roger Moore, you'd be surprised how big he was. He was a very big man, huge shoulders, head and shoulders tall to me. And I always felt that I was had a sort of slight personality. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't big enough. I didn't think I wasn't hefty enough, really. And uh, so, I, and I, then I became one of the actors who said to the press, "No, I categorically no, I'm not a gentleman." And I really was a bit relieved. I didn't think I'd been very good. But but you did some commercials where you were sort of did, yeah, secret agent. I did, yeah, I did that kind of thing. Yeah. That's about as far as I think the same is fine. Yeah. Same. But the same and, and Bond were a bit different. Mm -hmm. yeah. The same was just a sort of cheerful 
Ruffles like Ruffles like right. yeah. yeah. You didn't have to have muscles and things like that. Very Fond, I think you have to have some kind of F2. Well, the, the saint was more in the, in the, the genre of the Avengers. Yeah. You know, yeah. sort of the pattern. Yeah. 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 John Speed type. Trick your way out. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So the answer is I was considered and rejected. So. <laughs> yeah. so ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce to you Ogilvy. Thank you. Ian Ogilvy. Ian Ogilvy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming around. Thank you. Thank you for coming.